point, let me encourage uh, those of you to continue with the great things you're doing in STEM, science, technology, education, uh, engineering, and math, but also to be sure we have that global look as well and include languages in your, your thoughts for education for yourselves and your kids in the future. In the end, it does uh, cut the stall. Now this one, I just uh, want to point out the importance for those teachers and mentors in the group. Different times in our lives, we're always teaching, always mentoring people. But you can always have a, an effect on young people that you might not expect. Uh, and this in particular is an example of that. At the end of five spacewalks, one after the other, for a week, Monday through Friday, the last guys were out, that was uh, 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 John Grunsfeld and Rick Linehan, and, and John said a very nice thing because we're at the pointy end of the stick, but there's a whole lot of people who make this happen. And so he said a very, very nice thank you. Rick wanted to say thank you also, and uh, he's kind of an interesting kind of guy, and so his thank you went like this. He actually dedicated the flight to his high school physics teacher, who had once told him that all he'd be good for is taking up space. <laughs> so be careful. They, the kids remember these things, we say. I really got motivated, of course, with watching humans land on the moon. Uh, I'd been following it before that, but watching humans land on the moon, that was really motivating for me. So I'll admit I'm one of those kids who grew up always wanted to be an astronaut, and the truth is I still want to be an astronaut. I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's still very exciting, and, and if I get to have a, I'm on my second career now, having finished the NASA side, and I'm now working up, I'm actually a, a teacher, I'm a professor of space systems, up at the Naval Post Graduate School in Monterey, and that's my second career. But if I get to have a third career, or if I win the lottery, then I'm going to go back into space. The space shuttle, when it launches, it goes from sitting on the, the launch pad to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. And to do that, it just gets up and, and leaps off the launch pad. Uh, there are people who have cars that go from you know, zero to 60 in six seconds. So the shuttle goes from zero to 100 in seven seconds uh, straight up. So when it gets up, it goes, and, and it's like a, you're sitting on the, the launch pad, and when the, the solids ignite, and I've got a video, uh, which I'll show if, if, if you all would like, it, just to remind you of a launch. Launches are really spectacular. The, uh, you feel like two of your best buddies have just jumped on your chest. Basically, you're going at about three gravities. And, and that's the maximum. Because of this large tail, let's see. Yeah, because of this large tail and these large wings here, they limit the amount of gravities that you feel to three. Now, the Apollo program, they had five Gs during passing because they had a, what I'd call a real rocket with a pointy end up front and the people up on the top and, and very aerodynamically shaped, and they could handle five Gs on their asset. That launch was a, that was actually my, my son's fifth birthday, March 1st, 2002, and uh, he likes to, we told him it was the, the largest uh, birthday candle we could get for him. And, uh, he likes to remember it that way. That's Sergey doing that. One thing I'll point out is here we are, and, and there's this, let's see if I have that picture, there it is. There's this, this is the, uh, right here, we went and docked with that. There's a long corridor in it, a long corridor. And that picture is here, this is a long corridor inside. And you can see Sergey and I working here. There's Nancy Curry back there, working in the back. Uh, and here's a picture of it, kind of empty, and, uh, and then so Sergey, we'd gotten all our work done, of course, because we did all our work first, but then Sergey said, watch this. So we knew to get out of the way because something was going to happen. What Sergey did is he got on this back end here. On the other side of that hatch is, is vacuum of space, but on this side is a long corridor. And he kind of set himself up just like I am sitting in that picture, and he pushed off. And he went all the way down that corridor and did that Superman thing. He flew down the middle of the corridor and never touched the sides. It was a, just a beautiful push off, beautiful flying. And then he said, I'm not saying we're competitive, but he did say, now Amerikonski, now Amerikonski, you try it. And so, okay, he'd spent 15 months in space, and obviously he wasn't working on scientific projects the whole time, because he was really good at this. So we practiced a little bit, and then pretty soon we were doing it too. Superman things, really fun all the way down. Don't touch the sides, you get extra style points. Once we had that figured out, Sergey said, okay, now watch this. And so Sergey does the Superman thing again, but well, 
you know, we all know that a cat, if a cat falls out of a tree, what happens? It flips over and lands on its feet. How does it do that? You can't push against the air. Well, it turns out that you can rotate your arms and legs one direction and your body the other direction, and pretty soon you can actually change your orientation too, just like a cat, if you're floating in space at least, and you don't have to worry about hitting the ground anytime soon. So Sergei does the little twist thing as he does the Superman thing this time, and this time he does a little twist thing, and the next thing you know he's done a 90 degree perfect turn. Then he does another one, another 90, another 90, another 90. Before he gets to the other end, he has done 360 all the way around. He looked at us and said, okay, now you try that. And that was hard. Okay, we didn't have 15 months to work on our technique. It also turns out that Sergei Kreklov is the uh, aerobatic champion of the Soviet Union. That's a ringer for you. He was good. Enjoy flying with him. Family. And uh, here we are. This is the, the digital camera that was in the telescope uh, before we traded it out for a new one. Now, the size of it, you can see here, is outlined right here. There's the size of the, the CCD array. But you'll notice it's blank here. They ran out of money. They couldn't put in all the CCDs when they were first developing the Hubble. So they ended up having this interesting pattern. This one CCD was actually of a higher resolution than the others. And what the, the director of the Hubble Space Telescope Institute did is he said, because he was the director, the boss estimates him to do some crazy things, he said he's going to point the Hubble Space Telescope in a direction where there are no stars. In fact, Nothing had ever been observed there that was of any interest whatsoever. And after 80 hours, which is a lot of public time, and people were criticizing that, why are you doing that? After 80 hours, this is the picture he got. He looked up by the, near the north, uh, up by the Big Dipper, in a little place where it's really dark, and if you look here, you really can't see any stars. Oh, here's one. Here's a couple of stars. You see the stars, because they have those little diffraction pattern when they have the little crosses on them. Everything else, every other piece of light in that picture is a galaxy. And it turns out that anywhere you look in our universe, any direction, there's galaxies. And that's a tiny little bit of the sky, 3,000 galaxies. It turns out in our galaxy, there's about 100 million stars. 100 billion, excuse me. In our galaxy, there's about 100 billion stars. And in our universe, we estimate there's about a trillion galaxies. There's more galaxies in the sky than there are stars in our galaxy. It's a big place. Now, even Stephen Hawking is getting into the are there aliens question. We've been thinking about this for quite a while, as I'm sure you have. And people want to know, are there aliens? Well, the way I look at it is, if you go outside, it's very clear that the Earth is flat. Uh, except it turns out that it's round. Well, but at least it's very obvious if you go outside that the sun goes around the earth just like the moon does. Well, it turns out that the earth goes around the sun. But, but we're very special in the universe. You know, we're the only place where there's life. Well, I have a hunch that it's going to turn out that just like we're finding planets on all the other stars, so that our star is actually a typical star with typical planets. So we're going to find out that on some of those planets, not all, just like our solar system, on some of those planets there's going to be light. It might not be close by, it might be further away, but I'm convinced that there's going to be a lot of light. As you probably know, and if you don't, I'd like